Born in chaos, the planet nurtured life through fire and ice. Oxygen allowed life to grow and spread across the planet. Life settled into a rhythm and pattern. Then fires burned from within. Most of life was wiped out. And the dinosaurs came to rule for millions of years. Disaster from space wiped them away. Mammals would rise and dominate the miracle planet. Today, Zhejiang province in southern China is a place of agriculture and growth. And the rocks here show evidence of the greatest mass extinction that the planet has experienced. For geologists, this is a window into the past. Hey, Sam, maybe you can find your charcoal today with sunshine. <laughs> so you want to go out from here? Yeah, and here at the... Uh, Geologists Dr. Yugen Jin and Dr. Douglas Irwin are seeking answers to exactly what did cause almost all the life on Earth to become extinct. These rocks were once a part of a vanished sea. And where they end marks one of the boundaries where the world changed. Although very limited in numbers, there are some fossils that still remain. These attracted attention, for they hinted at a total change in the environment. Chloride is a paper-thin, incredibly abundant, so you find pavements of tens of thousands of these uh, very, very thin bivalves in the early Triassic. Many times, bivalves similar to this were found in low oxygen settings. So one hypothesis is that the abundance of this particular species indicates that there were low oxygen conditions in the earliest part of the Triassic. It seems that the planet heated up at the same time as oxygen levels plummeted. Some cataclysmic event had spread across the globe. Clues to what happened came from the oil fields in the west of Siberia. As they drilled deeper, a remarkable discovery was made. The bedrock beneath the oil layer was lava, which reached down almost two miles beneath the Earth's surface. Samples of the lava were dated back to exactly the same time as the mass extinction. The spread of lava was even greater than it was first thought. It bulged out to cover an area almost the size of Western Europe. This mountain range was once molten lava. What happened was the greatest volcanic eruption to have ever occurred in the long history of the planet.
Researchers from Russia and the United Kingdom began to suspect that the eruption in Siberia was in some way responsible for the global extinction of so many species. The team was led by Dr. Andrew Saunders of Leicester University. It could have been just another peaceful day. The force of the eruption shot lava as high as 3,000 meters, almost 10,000 feet into the air. Curtains of blazing fire stretched across the horizon. Nothing living in the immediate area could have escaped. Dr. Saunders and his team began to explore just what caused this massive eruption. Gradually, their attention was drawn to huge rifts and splits beneath the surface of West Siberia. Some are 100 kilometers or 60 miles wide, and they stretch for almost 1,000 miles. He thinks these are evidence of what caused the massive eruptions. The uplift, the doming that uh, triggered this rifting, also we estimate was of the order of 1,000, perhaps 1,500 kilometers across. Again, you're looking at an area of a substantial portion of Western Europe. The end of the Cretaceous, we see evidence that the impact came from above a meteorite impact 65 million years ago, extinguishing a large amount of life. But at the end of the Permian, what we seem to be seeing is that there's impact from beneath, from deep within the Earth. And this seems to have been causing extinction at that time. The doming that Dr. Saunders talks about is a phenomenon caused by the molten rocks just below the crust. In parts of the planet, this rock experiences greater vertical movements than were previously imagined. In the vicinity of deep ocean trenches, some dramatic movements have been detected. In one, an enormous rock plate has gradually dropped into the regions close to the Earth's core. In other parts of the world, Surges of the heated rock have also been detected. The mantle moves closer to the Earth's crust, and this is what scientists think happened in Siberia. When land masses are clustered together, there is a greater possibility of this occurring. Three hundred million years ago, there was one supercontinent, Pangaea. This vast land mass was surrounded by a deep ocean trench. From this trench, rock plates which had formed the continent dropped slowly toward the Earth's core. This resulted in a surge of heated rock towards the crust. The plume is forced up until it breaks the surface in a massive eruption, a dome of lava rising from the center of the Earth. Thus, the first cause of the mass extinction came from within.
Although this was an eruption on an unprecedented scale, it was still localized. This alone could not have wiped out most of life on Earth, but perhaps it was the trigger. All life in the immediate vicinity would have been wiped out, but not across the globe. Some other factor must have been in play. Evidence came from drilling in the deep ocean off Japan in 2002. The offshore survey is searching for methane hydrate, which could become an alternative energy source. Methane hydrate is a unique substance formed when water and methane gas bond together. When buried deep beneath the ocean, it is frozen. Deep in the seabed, where the temperature is always low, methane hydrate is very stable. Once the temperature rises, it melts and generates methane gas in volumes over 150 times larger than when the gas was bonded. It is very volatile. China, at the boundary that marks the mass extinction, evidence was found that large amounts of methane hydrate had started to melt at the same time as the Siberian eruption. And also, there was a dramatic increase in an element called carbon-12. Methane hydrate also contains high levels of carbon-12. The two had to be connected. But perhaps methane hydrate was the culprit which caused the mass extinction. Dr. Paul Wignall of the University of Leeds in Great Britain is certain that methane hydrate was one of the culprits. Of course, ice melts, and in fact, you, we know from the present-day methane hydrates, which are trapped beneath the sediment, that it would only take a temperature rise of, of the waters uh, of a few degrees, and then we would start melting that ice, and as the ice melts, it will release its methane, which will bubble out to the um, ocean surface, and, there, and then, hey presto, you've got a, a, a nasty greenhouse gas escaping. And we think that this, this melting of methane hydrates may have happened at the end of the Permian. There is always cause and effect. This volcanic eruption released huge quantities of carbon dioxide, which then caused the Earth's temperature to climb. As the water temperature rose, methane hydrate began to melt. Methane is 20 times more efficient as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Global temperatures soar, thus releasing even more methane hydrate. We get a positive feedback. The, the release of the methane will accelerate the increase of warming, which will release more methane, which will make accelerate more and more the, the global warming, until eventually you have this, this catastrophic increase. It's a sort of a super greenhouse climate, probably the hottest that the planet has been for the, the past sort of 600 million years or so. Once started, the process is hard to stop. At the equator, temperatures rose by several degrees, but at the poles, by a massive 25 Celsius, almost 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And this had a devastating effect around the globe. Entire ecosystems vanished. And if this wasn't bad enough, oxygen levels dropped. 
This was the critical element of extinction, triggered by the volcanic eruption. And the firm evidence of that can be found in the frozen continent of Antarctica. Amidst the exposed rocks of the Transantarctic mountain range, researchers from the USA and South Africa pool their resources. Dr. Greg Ritalik of the University of Oregon is team leader. He has detected a very rare mineral locked in the rock strata, which immediately followed the mass extinction. In this part of the sequence that's exposed here, in the very early Triassic, we have some really unusual soils. I've not seen anything like them anywhere else but in this particular early Triassic zone of death. Here's one here. Top of it's there, root traces go down to this unusual nodule here. It's a very weird mineral called berthyrene, and it indicates very low oxygen conditions in the early Triassic. The mineral, berthyrene, cannot be produced when oxygen is abundant. The discovery of this mineral is added proof that the world had undergone great change. It would have been hot, and the animals that depended upon oxygen would have suffocated. Dr. Bob Berner of Yale University fed data based on different geological findings into a computer. This is his result. Oxygen levels today are about 20%. Just before the mass extinction, oxygen levels had risen to around 30%. Then it plummeted to 10%. Several factors were at work. When the plants died out, they stopped producing oxygen. And methane gas released from the seabed reacted with oxygen molecules, considerably reducing the atmospheric levels. Some animals managed to survive. One of them was the creature we think is our common ancestor, Cynodont. That it survived at all is probably due to chance and luck. Yet this oxygen-depleted climate allowed a species of reptile to dominate all life on the miracle planet. There are a few fossils immediately above the boundary line drawn in the rocks. But then it changed. Plants had returned, but so had the reptiles. They had grown into giants, the dinosaurs. They spread into every available niche. There were herbivores like these massive Apatosaurus, terrible predators like the Allosaurus. There were mammals at this time too, our ancestors, but they were of necessity small and secretive, though very recent findings suggest that they did prey on some of the smallest of the dinosaurs. What has fascinated science is why these reptiles were so much more active than other animals. Because they're cold-blooded, heat would certainly help. But perhaps oxygen had a part to play as well. This topic has fascinated Dr. Mark Norell of the American Museum of Natural History. He began to compare some of the specific characteristics of dinosaurs from their fossils. Some of them, it seems, share organs very similar to those of modern birds. This is the neck vertebra of an Andean condor. And it's a very, very complex structure. Basically, this is the 
front of the vertebra right here. This is the, what's called the neural spine. This hole that goes right through here is where the spinal cord would have gone through. But if you look very carefully, you'll see that there's almost a sponge-like tissue of little pockets and holes throughout the entire body of the vertebra itself. And this is where the air sacs permeated the bone itself. Now this can be compared almost exactly with this Allosaurus right here. We have the same thing. We have the tall neural spine up on the top. We have the cavity, which is here filled by rock, where the spinal cord went through. And we have some of these pneumatic cavities, or these air spaces, which are found in the same position as that of the Andean condor. Birds are probably descended from dinosaurs. And today, only birds have an air sac system for breathing, a very specialized evolution of the respiratory system. In an ordinary breathing system, the lungs are alternately filled with oxygen and carbon dioxide. This happens because the same pathway is used for inhaling and exhaling air. Oxygen in, then carbon dioxide out. It's the way we breathe. In an air sac system, two different pathways are used for inhaling and exhaling. This is achieved by making use of special bags called air sacs, which are part of the modified lung system. With this method of breathing, the lungs are always filled with fresh oxygen. Migratory birds can fly at altitudes in excess of 30,000 feet, where oxygen levels are so low that without the air sac system of breathing, they would simply not have the energy. The system is thought to be at least three times as efficient as our normal lungs. Perhaps dinosaurs also evolved this same way of breathing to cope with low oxygen levels after the mass extinction. Dr. Peter Ward of the University of Washington has been researching why dinosaurs were able to remain the dominant species for as long as they did. I remember a dinosaur expert scratching his head in public and also writing in print saying, I can't understand. These man-like reptiles have such better teeth. And yet these really primitive toothed dinosaurs survive and flourish. You should think that these would be the winners and these the losers, and it's just the opposite. Well, just the opposite probably isn't so much from the feeding as it is from the respiration. During the age of the dinosaurs, the mammals remained small and secretive. They did not adapt to the low level of oxygen as perhaps the dinosaurs did. Yet, it was the mammals who survived. We have two mass extinctions. The first one kills off 90% of everything. The second one kills off less. And the reason it kills off less is that there are creatures which are now adapted to deal with this crisis. They are ready for it, and they skate right through it and advance. The oxygen, low levels of oxygen, continue right into the Jurassic. Mammals which survive are having a very hard time. Being a mammal is tough enough. Tasting great is even tougher. But being a mammal with a very bad lung system, and you're not very good, the best you can do is small or hide. And in long periods of time, you're probably not capable of a lot of rapid movement. And instead, you have all these super skaters around you, these motor scooter dinosaurs, which are extracting oxygen more efficiently. They can last longer than you can. They can run faster than you can. They're as intelligent as you are. They do better. Dinosaurs in that world are just better. Dr. Smith of the South African Museum thinks that our distant ancestors also took an evolutionary step by improving their own breathing system. He was researching Thrinaxodon, 
one of the cynodont group of mammal-like reptiles which did survive. He thinks that there is evidence that it was beginning to adapt to environments with low oxygen levels. In its ancestral form, the rib cage covered the entire trunk. Now the rib cage covered only its chest. It shows a very distinctive change in rib morphology about midway down the, down the trunk, about this level here. And in fact, it's very similar to the change in rib morphology that humans have. Um, and it's, uh, it's postulated that this could have been um, uh, caused or, or, or could have supported the, a diaphragm. And uh, a diaphragm, of course, increases the efficiency of, of inhalation and exhalation of air into the lung. When the diaphragm goes down, more oxygen can be taken in. When it rises, it helps to exhale a greater amount of air from the lungs. This was perhaps an adaptation to low oxygen levels, but not as efficient as the dinosaurs. Strangely, this adaptation of the ribcage was to give mammals a huge advantage millions of years later. Most mammals can twist their trunks so that their abdomen can face sideways, an advantage if you feed your young with breast milk. With the ribcage extending all the way to the trunk, as with reptiles, this posture is almost impossible. Even though mammals were unable to cope well with low oxygen content, the evolutionary advantage of their lung system proved to be a survival factor. Fossilized for all time, a mother and offspring lie side by side. This was found in South Africa. Immediately following the mass extinction, mammals began a different lifestyle. They cared and nurtured their young, fed them with breast milk. Scientists think that the low oxygen levels continued for a further hundred million years. And this played its part in the evolution of true mammals. This fossil is the oldest known of a mammal which had a placenta. It was recently unearthed in China. It was found in strata dating back to 125 million years ago, at the time when dinosaurs were at their peak. This could be the ancestor from which all placental mammals, including humans, have evolved. Dr. Ji Kiang was part of the team that announced the discovery. Uh, with mammals like us, the mother and her child came to be linked by the placenta. Her blood flows through the umbilical cord to the developing fetus. Red blood cells laden with oxygen are fed to her infant, supporting the growth and development inside her womb.
perhaps instigated by low oxygen levels, this relationship between mother and young was a new evolutionary step and is unique to the mammals of the miracle planet. Some 65 million years ago, the mammals were still obliged to live in secrecy, still trying to stay hidden from the giant reptiles which had ruled the world for the previous 150 million years. But that reign was to come abruptly to a close. When you go to the end of the Cretaceous to see the rocks deposited then, there's very easy to recognize evidence that an enormous catastrophe was caused by this asteroid impact. We see the result of tidal waves. We find material falling from the sky. We even find minerals that we don't find on Earth, such as iridium. Dinosaurs were wiped out. The mammals survived. Now we stand and wonder at the bones of these giant lizards, which were the dominant species for so long. The world was now for the taking. Mammals were able to move into every niche, but it was one group that lived in the trees that began a new line in the evolutionary path. This fossil dates to about nine million years after the dinosaurs had gone. It's called Carpolestes. There is a feature of this skeleton which is intriguing. On one of its limbs, there are fingers, and one of them bends toward the palm. This is what primates have today. From this fossil, we can try to reconstruct its world. Like many mammals, it was probably nocturnal. More than likely, it spent most of the time in the trees. It was safer there than on the forest floor. Its diet may have been fruit and berries, but Carpolestes' lifestyle had hardly changed since the time of dinosaurs. There were still ferocious predators on the prowl. This fossil gives the clue. The creature which made this footprint was a contemporary of Carpolestes. They belong to a bird, a giant bird called Diatrima, almost two meters, seven feet tall, possibly the largest animal on land. Once the dinosaurs had gone, birds like this seized dominance. Dr. Lawrence Whitmar is a dinosaur expert at Ohio University. He has been studying the ecology of these giants for the last 15 years. He is fascinated by the skull. Well, when I first saw the skull of Diatrima, the first thing that I was struck by was its size. It's absolutely huge. This comes from a bird, but it's larger than any known bird skull that's living today. It's potentially uh, larger than what we see in a lion or a bear, but it's organized differently. What this animal used this unusual skull for.
From the CT scans of the bird's skull, he detected large cavities on the inside of the cranium. He thinks this is where the muscles to move the beak were supported. From their size, he is certain that the beak was very tough, capable of stripping flesh from prey animals, as lions do today. Its skull was very large in proportion to the size of its body. Obviously, it was a ferocious predator. We know that, that, that Diatrima, as, just like the Tyrannosaurus, had a very powerful bite that was, that was well adapted uh, for not just killing, but also removing the flesh uh, from, from the bones. Um, so in a sense, what we see here with, with Diatrima, and I would imagine that the animals of its day viewed it in much the same way, was Diatrima was in many respects sort of a mini T-Rex. This reconstruction is based on the evidence gathered from the fossils. There were four species of this giant bird. They lived in forests and grasslands, but because of their weight, they were flightless. They could probably run as fast as humans today. But at this time, mammals were still mostly small and weren't able to move swiftly. The ancestor of the modern horse would not have stood a chance. Once dead, the flesh would have been ripped from the body by the giant and powerful beak. Little wonder that many of the small mammals still kept to the trees. These giant birds ruled from Europe to North America. also on other continents in the southern hemisphere. Everywhere except Asia. Here there are no fossil birds, only mammals. The giant birds ruled their domain for another 15 or 20 million years. Their end came as a result of two things, a dramatic change in the climate and from conflict. Sixty million years ago, there was a long and narrow sea which stretched between Asia and Europe, separating the two continents. At the other end, Asia was connected to North America by a land bridge located far north and under permanent ice. Nothing could cross in or out of Asia. So in Asia, mammals began to diversify, safe from the threat of the gigantic birds. And among the mammals was a predator, smaller than the birds, but with distinct advantages, as Dr. Chris Beard knows. The hyenodontids were an amazing group of predatory mammals. Uh, there were really two main things that distinguished the hyenodontids from any other kinds of predatory mammals that were alive at this time. Uh, the first was that the hyenodontids had three sets of teeth on the upper and the lower jaws that, that were used to cut through flesh. Uh, the other thing that set hyenodontids apart for their time was that they were very fast runners. 
Um, the, the other uh, predatory mammals that were alive at the time of hyenodontids were slow, uh, ponderous animals that were not fast runners. Some of them could climb and, and were arboreal, but none of them were qu quick runners. The smooth round joints and sockets show that this creature was able to run fast and hunt down its prey. There would come a time when the mammal predators would come face to face with diatrima, and there would only be one victor. But first, the ice bridge had to go. And it did. Once again, the climate shifted. Ice had melted and the land bridge was open. A confrontation was inevitable. It was just a matter of time. It was the mammals who made the journey to North America. We can imagine that hyenodontids, because they were fast runners, must have been the first pursuit predators. They must have been very wolf-like in the way that they hunted. Uh, they probably uh, ran around in packs and chased down their prey. Uh, that not only allowed them to capture their prey, but it also allowed them to capture larger prey. So when hyenodontins finally did migrate into the West, into North America and into Europe, it really signaled a change. And in a sense, um, dinosaur mammals had been sort of suppressed even during the age of dinosaurs. But even when dinosaurs became extinct, it was still another 15 or maybe even 20 million years before we can really say that the age of mammals began. The forests of the night were still dangerous places but now, mammal hunted mammal. Our ancestors, the primates, clung to the trees for shelter. But the evolutionary road was inevitably leading to the species which would rise to dominate the world. The eyesight of the primates evolved to be sharp. Their brain grew to be intelligent. They came to walk on two legs and to finally rule the miracle planet. <laughs> 